By the writings of the philosophant Ishmael the Ancient, in the eye of the storm there lies truth, for it is better to perish in the cold depths of the void than to be cast down to the surface of some hateful orb, there to flounder, worm-like and craven. The Age of Darkness does not lack, for stories of those who sought the death in fire over the passage in ignominy. Indeed, tales of precisely the sort have filled in dire archives, and your humble servant has personally chronicled quite a quantity. A great many, far, far too many, perished in the fires of Horus Lupercal's ambition, and did so in the colors of their legion. In full loyalty to their Primarch, in the name of either their Emperor or their War Master. They did so as part of a legacy, noble or wretched. Names, where possible, entered into honor rolls or the tally of the damned. Yet the Horus Heresy was a time where the ties that bind were sundered in a great many ways. There exist creeping at the peripheries, lurking in the shadows, hiding between the pages, tales and accounts of those Astartes that followed altogether different paths, forging for themselves their own destinies in a galaxy gone mad. They still perished in the void ancient Ishmael once wrote of, but did so upon their own terms. Know then, that this is a record of renegades and reavers, the great and the damned, a record of the black shields of the Age of Darkness. Following the Istvan III atrocity and the subsequent dropsite massacre on Istvan V, and the various scatterings of Loyalist legions through the War Master's sinister machinations, it was not uncommon to find bands of Legionnaires Astartes warriors operating outside the nominal Imperial chain of command, forced to adapt to dire circumstances that had befallen them. These space marines formed scratch-built military formations and followed objectives they alone were capable of setting. The most iconic of these were formed out of the so-called Shattered Legions, a historator's term retroactively created and applied to those legionaries of the Raven Guard, Iron Hands, and Salamander's legions who had escaped the horrors of Istvan V against all odds. Their legions having effectively ceased as formal functioning military bodies, their primarchs either dead or missing, their methods and organization were forced to adapt rather dramatically. The scattered elements thrown together by fortune and fate. Groups of legionaries from these three legions coalesced in desperation, fleeing traitor hunter killer squadrons across an entire sector of space. Some did not survive, but many, however, did, and the tales of their exploits would go on to fill chronicles of the subsequent Age of Darkness. The Shattered Legions were, of course, not the only irregulars of this epoch. Legion elements from across the entirety of the Legion as Astartes, traitor and loyalist both, were all cut off and isolated from their commanders, thrown in together with allies of convenience or desperate blood brothers seeking any aid in the madness the galaxy had been plunged into. Notable commanders forged desperate bands of Astartes into ad hoc but nonetheless effective fighting forces, wielding them against their foes as best they could in the given circumstances. In the broadest of possible terms, Black Shield is a name for an Astartes that fought during the wars of the Horus Heresy in irregular units, but one entirely different from the Shattered Legion format discussed previously. 
Shattered Legion forces, for all being comprised of Astartes from highly different legions, still almost always fought on behalf of the side their parent legions were sworn to, be they loyalist or traitor, and made efforts to continue their personal legion's traditions, cultures, and specialities. A Black Shield, however, was an Astartes who entirely denounced their parent legion, cutting off all ties, renouncing all oaths, discarding the legacy of that legion that they had been raised within. The origins of this term are hazy at best. Its earliest usage appears as shorthand in Divisio Militaris reports from the Age of Darkness itself, and at some point gained traction within scholarly circles in the immediate aftermath of the Siege of Terra, as chroniclers now long dead attempted to assess and archive what scraps of knowledge could be saved from the fires that had consumed the Imperium. It was, in many ways, quite literal in its meaning. The earliest examples of Black Shields in the history of the Great Heresy are of Astartes whose divestment of their legions was viscerally accomplished by the scouring of their panoply of war. Heraldry and colors once so proudly worn were daubed in flat black paint, stripped entirely down to the base gray of ceramite, or scoured by flame in fiery rituals. The cultural connotations of the color, death, despair, melancholia, and tragedy, were thought to deliberately evoke martial traditions of the warrior ashamed, the exiled, the oathbreaker. One of the earliest examples of their appearances was in the war for the Coronid Deeps, one of the first major targets of the War Master in 007 M31. A number of legionaries in black, yet still bearing the Terran Aquila, were observed fighting alongside Loyalist forces, although were not responsive to entreaties from the formal chain of command. All attempts at communication were refused, and as the anarchy of the Manichean conquest unfolded, the thread of their fate was swallowed by the terrible events. It is likely we get the term Black Shield from these reports, and it has remained with us ever since. It has been a rather robust item of terminology. Despite the broad early trend of these formations of Astartes to adopt black armor, no two forces were identical. Many, indeed, adopted entirely new panoplies and heraldries and colors, unique and distinct not only from the legions, but also from each other. A formal military classification for such a cornucopia of formations was impossible, hence one was forced, as with one's colleagues of years past, to continue using Black Shield to describe them all. The Age of Darkness created the threads of far more mysteries than it did answers, and few have been more vexing for the lords and worthies of the Imperium than the concept of renegade Astartes seemingly beholden to none but themselves. These individuals, and their reasons for doing so, appear to have been idiosyncratic in the extreme. Some of them were shattered in mind, the limits of their maimed transhuman psychology overwhelmed by the events that had plunged the galaxy into chaos. Even legionaries loyal to Terra were no stranger to the specter of essential insanity seeded by grief. One's record upon the Iron Hands and their actions in the wake of the Dropside Massacre should easily stand as testament to this. These individuals, broken utterly by the War Master's betrayal and the sundering of the Emperor's Great Crusade, appeared to simply wish to remove themselves from the equation, determining to strike out for their own destiny in a world gone berserk. Some historitors past have attempted to draw comparisons between them and the forces of the Shattered Legions. One, however, would caution against this analogy. The disparate forces of the Shattered Legions strove to maintain identities that aligned with the side of the conflict they had pledged their banners to, continuing definitive senses of Legion heritage. Black Shields did precisely the opposite, going to often extraordinary lengths to denounce their origins and forge new identities. 
Theirs was a rejection of their birthrights, denials of either the heroism or perfidy that was now to be their supposed legacies. This, too, extended to the ultimate aims of the Black Shields, which were, of course, unique to each warband. Shattered Legion forces, where possible, cooperated with and supported warriors under either the Imperial Aquila or the Eye of the War Master. Black Shields fought entirely for their own goals, and were anything but predictable. Their wars were private affairs, and oft bitter and callous in the extreme. Many, indeed, adopted a singularly mercenarial attitude, initially fighting for one side and then the other and back again, based either on whims, greed, or some unknowable objective. Inscrutable and often deliberately antagonistic, Black Shields were an utterly random and wholly vexatious element in the grander schemes of the Horus Heresy, and one that would wreak havoc on the strategic planning of both sides. They were part of no chain of command, and in the instances where communication was actually permitted, they maintained a fiercely independent streak, answerable to no one, with no tactical coordination attempted nor expected. In furious exasperation, the Council of Terra declared a great many of them to simply be pirates, bereft of rights to anything other than death, posting active warrants of extermination upon those who flew certain and verifiable banners. It is likely that piratical reavers did not concern the War Master's forces quite so keenly, given their own predilections for the grand destabilizing of law and order, not to mention wanton disregard for sustainable resource extraction, but quite often the traitors ran afoul of a piratical Black Shield warband that was as equally happy to pillage from Horus's armies as they were from the Emperor's. This earned many a bounty from furious traitor commanders for their deaths. It is fundamentally impossible to assess the precise number of Black Shield warbands that operated during the Age of Darkness. They were, by their natures, reclusive and antagonistic, but it can be said with a degree of academic certainty that, just as none were alike, none bore any resemblances to the Legion as Astartes either, both in comparison and in culture. Observed military strengths have an almost hilarious range. Chronicles exist of a band of Black Shields that numbered a scarce two dozen warriors aboard a single escort bark, while others attest to the existence of chapter-sized formations of over 3,000 warriors, with significant naval and ground elements. The median range, however, was typically some two to three hundred individuals, with strength invariably concentrated upon infantry. Separated as they were from traditional legion chains of command and supply lines, whatever heavier or specialized equipment they may have possessed was in short supply and difficult to maintain. Raids against Legion Astartes supply depots, while a common tactic observed amongst Black Shield warbands, came with heavy risks, and many a formation simply adapted their tactics to accommodate what strengths they had, instead of retaining older and less practical methods of war-making. The range of arms and armaments also varied wildly, while the most robust of Legion Astartes' weaponry, the Bolter, for example, was always preferred, others yet outfitted themselves with weaponry raided from Solar Auxilia or the Exertus Imperialis, while yet more bore weaponry that was clearly alien in origin, adapting tactics to suit their bizarre new armaments. Scholars of the Heresy, in attempting classification of such a vast array of accounts, have developed a rudimentary taxonomy to describe the Black Shield warbands of the Age of Darkness in admittedly simplistic, but nevertheless necessary, terms. By far the most common of these Black Shields fell into the category of renegades, those who had turned their back on the ideology of their Primarch and stood in opposition to them. This worked in both directions. Many warbands that took their black armorials of the era 
were lost Astartes of the Traitor Legions, those for whom odes to the Emperor outweighed their genetic loyalty to Primarch, but so too were others Astartes of Loyalist Legions, for whom the turning of the War Master had stirred with him then convictions harbored in secret, convictions that exploded into bloody realization as these once loyal brothers sought power amongst the hosts of the Lost. While some Astartes of the age retained elements of their former legions, such as the infamous Alastor Rushal, a Raven Guard brother who joined the traitor Night Lords, what separates renegade Black Shields is their utter rejection of their former identities. Rushal forever bore his old color and emblems, albeit defaced. A Black Shield scoured every hint of their old legion from their armor. These renegades were often single-minded in their pursuit of their former brethren, often to suicidal extremes, discarding military sense should a chance to inflict suffering upon their erstwhile kin be presented. Hatred had replaced duty, and no cost was too high if its payment caused pain against their old legion. It is perhaps not a surprise that the majority of these warbands did not survive the Horus Heresy driven as they were to destruction in the name of their newfound and forlorn cause. Curiously, the overwhelming psychological shock of the Age of Darkness expressed itself in other means than the suicidal rage of the Renegades. Perhaps the strangest of Black Shields were those historitors have come to term atavists, a term used to describe those for whom regression to earlier seemingly purer ideologies were a means of escaping the conflict they were inexorably being drawn into. Faced with the seemingly impossible truth of the Imperium's fragility, or the nature of the warp, or the Emperor, or his Primarchs, some Astartes simply turned away. Instead of taking the black, their armor was returned to the base storm gray of Factorium New Power Plate, the colors of the prototype legionaries of the Unification Wars. Abandoning frontline posts and the Loyalist Traitor Divide, these Black Shield bands made wake on stormy tides for the darkest and most isolated pockets of the galaxy, the empty uncharted reaches beyond the site of the Cartographica Imperialis. There, they made what one can only describe as delusional and theatrical recreations of the Great Crusade, conquering worlds in the name of the Emperor and of that era of expansion as they individually understood it. These warbands would brook no attempt to shatter their fantasies, violently turning upon emissaries from either Imperium or Warmaster that dared to transgress their claimed volumes with news of the actual state of the galaxy and entreaties to join either side. Unlike other Black Shield warbands, their rejection of Legion was less a total scouring of panoply and heraldry and more a regression to some state of imagined purity, typically before the reunification with said Legion's Primarch. In some cases, this even led to resurrections of older Legion cognomens, with reports existing of bands of atavist Black Shields in the liveries of the Storm Walkers, the Star Hunters, the Imperial Heralds, and the Dusk Raiders. The delusions here were myriad. Some atavist warbands rejected weaponry and armor patterns introduced after a certain year, while others organized themselves into company and battalion formations despite having utter lack of numbers to do so. Perhaps of all Black Shield warbands, the Antivists were amongst the most reviled, seen by Astartes on both sides of the conflict as little more than immature adolescents unable to grow up and cope with the reality of a changing world, retreating to imagined pasts, blankets of nostalgia, but the truth of the world could not exert itself. From one's own perspective, it is a stark reminder of the sheer psychological vulnerability present in members of the Legion as Astartes, one that expressed itself in other ways across other legions during this conflict, but one rarely so tied to inherently human desires to build oneself an insulated world 
where nothing can ever harm you and you will never have to engage with the truth on its own level. While the goals of the Atavist Black Shields may have had a twisted morality about them, those Black Shields termed marauders were entirely their opposites. The Horus Heresy shattered the illusion of the Pax Imperialis. The work of the Emperor of his Great Crusade had come tumbling down, and the tenuous lore and order of the Imperium with it. In this new, violent galaxy, some members of the Legion Azastartes found new purpose in the selfish use of their own strength. The War Master, the Emperor, they wanted empires, and Astartes could surely carve for himself a petty kingdom. Their only ideology was their greed, philosophies pinned on nothing but self-interest. Marauder Black Shields were Astartes for whom their might granted them right, the only order that made any sense to them in this new galactic order that Horus's treachery had created. As the mightiest beings in the galaxy, they would conquer, pillage, and rule at their own whims. The weak, baseline humanity, servile chattel for their use. There was little to differentiate the majority of these warbands from the types of piratical reavers commonly encountered by the Imperium in the Great Crusade, save, of course, for the unique viciousness of an Astartes bereft of any restraint upon their abilities or oversight of their actions. Reaving and pillaging marked their activities. Rare indeed was it that any would consciously choose to engage in open combat, and only did so when the odds were firmly stacked in their favor. Targets of opportunity were typically supply columns left poorly guarded, or fringe outposts with below-strength garrisons. The prizes taken being arms, ammunition, machinery, and human slaves. Any possible weakness in both loyalist and traitor sides both were seized upon, with the Astartes pirates inevitably fleeing back to whatever holdfast they claimed as their fife, proving to be a persistent pain to both sides of the conflict for its entire span. Indeed, many of these petty fiefdoms survived into the days of the Scouring. The regions of space they claimed plunged into wicked rule beyond the grasp of the Imperium for whole centuries. Those warbands, uncaring about possible chaotic taint, indeed readily welcomed fleeing traitor legionaries into their ranks, forming perhaps some of the first non-legion-aligned heretic Astartes warbands that yet continue to plague the Imperium. Altogether rarer, but mercifully so, were examples of Black Shields historators have simply come to term damned. Those Astartes who chose, for whatever reasons they may have had, to embrace everything the Emperor had forbidden. The Horus Heresy was an era in many ways defined by the unsealing of that best forgotten or undiscovered. And while the chaotic powers unleashed by the traitors will of course eat up the Leonid's share of the historiographical discourse upon the matter, there are a plethora of smaller but no less horrific examples for chroniclers of the arcane. The Emperor, in his wisdom, had placed many a seal upon the use of and research into a great many technologies, those born of the dark millennia of the Age of Strife or the Dark Age of Technology, those dangerous in the extreme. Secreted away in dozens if not hundreds of shadowy corners of the galaxy, the remnants of old night, or times earlier still, lay dormant, awaiting rediscovery by those with either the ignorance or the ego to believe they could master what their forebearers could not. Some indeed had been protected by various branches of the Imperial household with jurisdiction over such arcana. The Legio Custodes, the Silent Sisterhood, and the Order Elucidatum. With the outbreak of the heresy, the latter of these organizations was simply disbanded and subsumed into the Sigilites' other operations, while the former two were occupied by a far greater purpose. Simply put, there was not the manpower to keep watch over the fearsome secrets of the past, and these inevitably began to find their way into the clutches of rebellious space marines. 
for whatever purpose, be it to inflict destruction on those they had once known as kin, to carve a delusional past into a future now dead, or to simply say to their own greed, Astartes began to wield forbidden tools against those who opposed them. Heinous experiments in psychic abominatia, xenotechnology, forgotten devices of the first human stellar exodus, mutagenic cloning, gene seed chimeric replication, or even the dreaded silica animus of abominable intelligence. Sundry examples persist in history and rumor of black shields using any and all of the above to advance their own aims. Many, of course, ended in swift and terrible disaster, consuming those that sought to wield them. But others persisted long enough to inflict significant harm upon their enemies before ultimately being consumed by whatever they had unleashed. While the questions raised within this chronicle have been fascinating, and the examples both lurid and numerous, one must remind acolytes that concrete, verifiable information upon black shields is an incredibly rare thing within surviving historiography. These Astartes were, by definition, isolated exceptions from the broader galactic rule that was the traitor and loyalist divide. Many warbands numbered but a few hundred individuals, and those perished shortly after their foundation. As such was the maddeningly high casualty rate with each passing year of the Age of Darkness. Their existence is, of course, confirmable, but often left with only one reliable encounter log, with a handful of picked or video captures serving as first-hand sources. What we have been left with is a nevertheless fascinating glimpse into a galaxy gone mad, where the ties that bound had been frayed and sundered. At Gamma Dvalin, for example, a group of Astartes wearing mismatched plate, seemingly torn from a dozen different legions, raided the vaults of Eterbia, breaching the quantum-locked stasis chambers within and spiriting away whatever they had contained. A month Terran standard later, N-dimensional weapons were unleashed upon the Sons of Horus at Iantana Minor, obliterating the legion's armies there and splitting in half the continent they had operated on. The perpetrators, according to recovered imagery, were Astartes in the same armor that had been seen at Gamma Dvalin, but now helmless, with each bearing a Chthonian gang symbol upon their brows. Elsewhere, the Sons of Horus under Tybalt Mar, captain of the 18th Company and placed in charge of the Legion's post-drop site pursuit operations, was ambushed by a Black Shields force later verified as having been led by Morcan Sale, a former Ravenguard strike centurion. The ensuing battle of the Ultinian Rings sought the destruction of a sky hive home to some 100,000 Imperial civilians. It was, of course, not merely the 16th Legion that felt the fangs of the Black Shields. At the gas giants of the Euro system, Black Shields, believed to be former Raven Guard by their complexion and genetic presentation, although each bearing the Eye of the War Master on their Mark VI plate, destabilized the orbit of the macro bastions the system was renowned for, plunging them into the crushing atmospheres below and causing the deaths of over 20 million colonists. The Death Guard heavy cruiser Morbid Revelation was boarded by Black Shields near Taracanus in a stunningly paced operation, only for the renegades to withdraw with seemingly few prizes. Their true objective was not noted until later, as in an ambush upon the Mechanicum exploratory vessel Radiant Precept, the morbid revelation fired its prow-mounted Nova cannon, only to discover it had been sabotaged. The ensuing backblast crippled the cruiser and forced its exit from the war, as well as ensuring the Mechanicum ship's escape. During the far-ranging battles for the Garmin Cluster, a Black Shield force identifying itself as the Gerasene Host assisted the White Scars in their capture of several traitor fortresses, but refused any and all communication both before and during the operations. 
It is believed the scouring of the Night Lords, home sector of Nostramo, was carried out by a Black Shields force known as the Ashen Claws, and that the Agentia Primus of the Sigilite, Nathaniel Garrow, was to have conducted negotiations with the famed Black Shield warlord known only as the Nemean, although both of these examples must wait for further exploration in chronicles penned by your humble servant. Perhaps the most well-known, and maybe most well-organized Black Shield force in historical record, is the so-called Fangs of the Emperor, a series of scratch-formed Astartes companies under the command of the former World Eater Indrid Har, and given tacit sigillite approval to operate alongside Loyalist armies during the battle for Beta Garmin. At their apex, the Fangs counted in their strength more than a thousand warriors, with both starships and super-heavy vehicles as part of their armory, the latter being extremely rare in the hands of Black Shields. They were additionally believed to have received both logistical support and leaked intelligence from senior figures within the Divisio Militaris, operating, one believes, at the behest of Malkador's office. The presence within the Fang's upper echelon of Unvakar Noon, a Davenite lodge priest that was revealed to have been a shape-shifting assassin from Clade Calidus, is perhaps the best proof of this. Initially, the Fangs counted within their ranks members drawn from primarily traitor hosts, such as the Death Guard, Iron Warriors, and Har's fellow former World Eaters, but would later come to operate alongside brethren from the Shattered Legions, notably the Raven Guard and the Iron Hands. Subsequent to the capture of the Sons of Horus starship Kikatrix Tyrannus, Endrid Har was instrumental in the stunning action of the Xana incursion, covered fully by oneself in an earlier record. Utilizing the captured Ordinatus Great Weaponry, the fangs of the Emperor ransacked the forge of Xana Tisiphone, withdrawing only when that damned forge world unleashed seemingly berserk automata upon them. This raid granted them the dubious honor of being the only Black Shield force to ever wield Ordinatus grade weaponry, although given the technology's extreme rarity, massive size, and difficulty of deployment, the Fangs are only recorded as having used it on three occasions. Due to high casualty rates, the pool of available officers that the Fangs could count upon was severely limited, and filled by, generally, the most talented killers amongst them who caught Endred Har's eye. Raised to ranks by their proficiency in murder, these Astartes were a far cry from the traditional officer corps of any legion, but their effectiveness can scarcely be doubted. The fangs of the Emperor serve as a curious but potent example of a Black Shield force from the Horus Heresy, and an even better example for the desperate lengths the Imperium went through to gain any advantage over the enemy. The Fangs, however, would meet the same fate as many of their war-sundered kindreds. Endritar, one of the last survivors of the warband, decimated as it was at the slaughter at Beta Garmin, perished in combat during the Saturnine Gambit at the Siege of Terra. He, alongside the blood angel Belsepetus, fought the first captain of the Sons of Horus, thrice damned Abaddon himself, in a personal duel. It took seven whole kill strikes for Abaddon to finally end Har's life. Whilst the Riven Hound entered heroically into Imperial Annals, death was the only fate he shared with other Black Shields. The multifarious threads of this deeply curious phenomenon are woven, largely silently, into the tapestry of the Horus Heresy. A thousand tragedies, a thousand atrocities, swallowed into a conflict like no other. Ave Imperator, Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, 
comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.